Greetings. Father Mark signing on, continuing the course on the history of the Catholic Church in the United States. Picking up where we left off last time, we began with the creation of the Diocese of Louisiana and the two Floridas. Pope Pius VI created this diocese on the 25th of April, 1793. The first bishop appointed was a Cuban-born prelate named Luis Ignacio de Penelvar y Cardenas. That's uh, Penelvar is P-E-N-A-L-V-A-R. And then the, the E is, is Y, actually, in Spanish. It's the two names of his families, of the, the paternal side and the maternal side. So Penelvar E. Uh, Cardenas, C-A-R-D-E-N-A-S. Born on the island of Havana on the 3rd of April, 1749. The son of a wealthy family, a Criollo family, uh, meaning uh, Spanish, pure Spanish blood, but born in the colony. Studied philosophy in uh, St. Ignatius College in Havana then completed a doctorate in theology from the University of St. Jerome in 1771. Two years later, he was appointed the Vicar General of the Diocese of Havana. When Pope Pius VI, at the request of King Carlos IV of Spain, created Louisiana and the two Floridas as a diocese, Penelvar was made its founding bishop. He made his entrance into the city of New Orleans on the 17th of July, 1795, took formal possession of his see, and in the following December, published uh, an instruction on the, the governance of the parishes and the diocese in Louisiana. He soon began a visitation of his diocese, which then extended over the uh, country, uh, part of the country, known later as the Louisiana Purchase. So this swath of territory went from the Great Lakes in the north to the Gulf of Mexico in the south, and then along, along the Gulf Coast from Louisiana to the Atlantic, over to, the, to Florida. On the 21st of April, 1796, he was at uh, uh, Iberville, Louisiana. On November 8th of the same year, he was in Natchitoches in the northern part of the state. On the 7th of May, 1798, he was at Pensacola, Florida. Upon his return to the city of New Orleans in 1799, he, drew, uh, he, he, he composed a report to the Spanish crown, in which he said, in part, he wrote in part, since my arrival in this town, on the 17th of July, I have been studying with the keenest attention the character of its inhabitants. On the 2nd of August, I began the discharge of my pastoral functions. The inhabitants do not listen to, or if they do, they disregard all exhortations to maintain in its orthodoxy the Catholic faith and to preserve the innocence of life. Because His Majesty tolerates here the Protestants for sound reasons of state, the bad Christians, who are in large numbers in this colony, think that they are authorized to live without any religion at all. Many adults die without having received the sacrament of communion. Out of 11,000 souls composing this parish, He's referring to St. Louis Parish, which is uh, now the cathedral. Hardly three to four hundred comply with the precept of partaking at least once a year at the Lord's Supper. No more than about the fourth part of the population of the town ever attends Mass. Their houses are full of books written against religion and the state. They are permitted to read them with impunity. And at the dinner table, they make use of the most shameful, lascivious, and sacrilegious songs. Excellent results are obtained from the convent of the Ursulines, in which a good many of the girls are educated, but their inclinations 
are so decidedly French that they have even refused to admit among them Spanish women who wished to become nuns so long as the applicants should remain ignorant of the French language. That's an excerpt. Uh, time passed, and Bishop Penelvar was promoted to become the Archbishop of Guatemala on the 20th of July, 1801, and by a rescript from Rome, was empowered to transfer his authority in Louisiana and the Floridas to a canon of the cathedral of Father Thomas Hassett, who was at his vicar general at the time, as well as to a Father Patrick Walsh. They were both Irish immigrant priests. He, um, uh, he resigned, he stayed in uh, Guatemala uh, until he retired in 1806 and then returned to Havana, spent the rest of his life there. In the uh, same year that the diocese was created, 1793, which is 11 years after Thomas Wyatt applied his steam-driven uh, steam engine, the steam-driven piston machine, to textile production, Eli Whitney, an American born in Westboro, Massachusetts, applied the steam engine to removing seeds from cotton by means of the cotton gin. This vastly increased the amount of cotton that could be brought to market and necessitated, or at least it was believed necessitated, the increase in the number of slaves working cotton plantations in the Americas. And, uh, and we'll see some of the results of that uh, in, as, in due course. Reverend Father uh, Stephen Theodore Badin, B-A-D-I-N, was the first Catholic priest ordained in the United States. Uh, uh, well, as uh, in, in the political entity of the United States, so we saw in the in the Spanish when the Spanish still control Florida, they had ordinations there, and of course Florida became part of the United States. But Badin was the first one ordained in the political entity uh, of the United States when it you know after it became the United States. Uh, he spent most of his long career ministering to widely dispersed Catholics. He did the, the, horse, the circuit ministry of, of, in Canada, down to Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, and Illinois. Badin was a refugee from the French Revolution. He was in seminary when the revolution began. His priestly formation in France was interrupted as the revolution became homicidally atheist. Uh, so he came to the United States, as, as you know, we met last time, some Sulpician priests did that also. Bishop Carroll assigned him as the proto-American missionary to the Trans-Appalachian area. You know, across, that, that's from Carroll's perspective in Baltimore. So going west, is the Appalachian Mountains, which run parallel to the uh, to the Atlantic. So crossing that uh, first brought Badin to Kentucky. He set up his first mission near Pottinger Creek in present-day Marion County, Kentucky. He spent much of his life on horseback, traveling through Ohio and even into Indiana. Father Badin allows us to date a new phenomenon in the nation's history. Immigration to escape political turmoil and religious persecution in Europe. As a result of the, uh, as the French Revolution became uh, violent, became truly homicidal, you know, the guillotine, and executing aristocrats and, and, and priests and uh, religious, and the coalition wars that lasted for a quarter of a century, a steady stream of refugees, including sizable numbers of French Catholics, German Catholics, and Irish Catholics, fled Europe for the promise of freedom in the New Republic. Kentucky 
where Badin uh, was first sent, entered the Union in 1792 as the first state of the New West, meaning west of the Appalachian Mountains. A large immigration from the eastern states poured into the area in the 1780s, which expanded the population to 75,000 by 1790. Among their number were many Catholic families from Maryland, especially younger sons, looking to acquire land on which they could create their own plantations. Early missionaries did not last long, tended not to last long. Uh, one of them, Father William de Rohan, uh, did open the state's first Catholic school, which was Holy Cross in Pottinger Creek in 1792. But he departed soon after because of the, the rigors of the, the horseback circuit ministry, which is, that was priesthood then. Uh, lasting ministry, lasting priestly ministry, began with Father Badin when he arrived in November of 1793. He was the first priest ordained uh, in the U.S. He was ordained by Bishop Carroll on the 25th of May, 1793, and he served as an itinerant missionary for nearly 60 years. He was born in Orléans, France, educated at uh, Montaigne College, uh, then at, at the Sulpician Seminary uh, in Paris. Shortly after he was ordained a deacon, he was forced to flee along with other Sulpicians in 1791 as the French Revolutionary government closed the seminary. Badin escaped Paris, made his way south to Bordeaux, which is uh, uh, southwest France. That's on the, well, it's on a river, on the Garonne River, which, which uh, empties into the Atlantic. So Bordeaux is actually, even though it's not actually on the Atlantic coast, because of the, the river, it is actually an Atlantic port. The American consuls in Bordeaux, uh, uh, Fenwick and Mason, arranged passage for Badin, as well as Benedict Joseph Flaget and Jean David to Philadelphia. Badin studied English at Georgetown, then was assigned by Bishop Carroll to Transappalachia. Father Badin, accompanied by Father Michael Barrier, began walking to Kentucky on September 3, 1793. They crossed the Appalachian Mountains, uh, took a flatboat down the Ohio River to Maysville, Kentucky, from where they walked to Lexington. Badin went to White Sulphur Springs, Kentucky, and established a mission under the patronage of St. Francis de Sales. In April of 1794, his companion missionary, Father Barrier, left Bardstown and left Kentucky and uh, ended up going to New Orleans, Louisiana. This guy, uh, Michael Bernard Barrier, was born in 1755 in Bordeaux, France into a family of municipal civil servants. He was ordained in May of 1782 and served as chaplain to a home for abandoned children until he also was forced to flee France when the revolution turned against the church. Arriving in Baltimore, like so many other refugees, Bishop Carroll sent him with Badin to Kentucky. But Barrier never acquired mastery of the English language, so he departed for Louisiana, where a substantial French-speaking population was to be found because of events that we've covered earlier in the course. To get there, he followed the Ohio River down to the Mississippi River, then south down the Mississippi to New Orleans, where he met Bishop Penelvar. Bishop Penelvar granted his desire to serve the French, assigned him to the Attacapa coast, uh, where he served as pastor of St. Martin of Tours Parish in St. Martinville, Louisiana, thereby connecting his story to that of the Cajuns that we covered previously. To the everlasting confusion of local historians, he signed his name Miguel, 
in the registers when Louisiana was Spanish, and then converted to Mikel, the French spelling, when they left. He remained at St. Martin until uh, after the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, at which point he was replaced by a Dominican priest, Gabriel Isabe, in 1804. Then, Barrier went to Opelousas, became pastor of St. Landry Parish, from where he continued making the pastoral circuit to Karen Crow, the Vermilion River Settlements, and Bro Bridge. The growth of the Acadian well, Cajun population uh, can be traced through these sites. In Karen Crow, he visited the homes of the uh, Arsenault family, Hebert, Bernard, uh, Carmpouche, Mir, Bro, and Mouton. At Grand Prairie, at the plantation of Jean Mouton, and the homes of the Thibodeau family, Rousseau, and Trahan families. Along the lower bayou, he visited the homes of the Daigle family, the Landrys, and the Comos. At New Iberia, he visited the home of the Saint Germain family. On Bayou Vermilion, he visited the home of the Martin family, or Martin, uh, spell Martin. In the course of his travels, uh, he was once captured and tortured by Indians who pulled out his fingernails. To, to amuse themselves. He witnessed a village grow uh, 2.5 miles north of the trading post at uh, Petit Manchac, a little, little Manchac, on the Vermilion. That village became known as Vermilionville, the village on the Vermilion River. A generation later, on December 30th, 1821, a church at Vermilionville was dedicated under the patronage of St. John the Evangelist. Part of the property was donated by Jean Mouton on the 21st of March, 1821. The Bishop of Louisiana at the time, William de Bourg, whom we'll, we'll meet, we'll cover him separately, appointed Father Barrier as the founding pastor of St. John the Evangelist. When his replacement at St. Martin Parish, Father Isabel, had a heart attack, Father Barrier added visits back to St. Martin to his horseback itinerary. After the restoration of the monarchy and the restoration of the church in France, uh, after the final defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo in 1815, uh, Barrier returned to locate any surviving relatives in France. He made it back. He crossed the ocean and made it back to France, but he died eight days after his return, of, died of an illness that he contracted on the voyage, sometime after July 21st, 1823. Now, rewinding to catch up with Father Badin, when Father Barrier left Bardstown, Kentucky in April of 1794, Stephen, Father Stephen Badin remained establishing his base at Pottinger Creek. For the next 14 years, like Barrier in Louisiana, Father Badin traveled, sometimes on foot, sometimes horseback, sometimes by riverboat, uh, or flatboat at that point. It would have, uh, they didn't have the steamboats yet, but so it would have been flatboats, uh, between widely scattered settlements in Kentucky and the Northwest Territory. In 1806, Badin received permanent help with the arrival of Father Charles Nerinx. That's N-E-R-I-N-C-K-X. Born in Belgium in 1761, the eldest of 14 children, born to a doctor, Father, uh, Father Sebastian Nerinx, and, uh, and a homemaker. His mother's name is Petronilla Legendre. He studied at uh, Angen and uh, made his stu then study philosophy at Louvain and entered the theological seminary, major seminary at Mechelen, was ordained a priest in 1785, was assigned to, as a, a vicar, to the cathedral at Mechelen. Uh, there he was noted for his ministry to the working classes. In 1794, he became a pastor 
until becoming an enemy of the revolution for refusing to abandon the faith when the French Revolution turned atheist. For a time, he ministered as an underground priest in disguise uh, until the church was restored by Napoleon. He then went to America in 1804, met Bishop Carroll, and Carroll assigned him to Kentucky in 1805 with care for an area 200 miles long. Like these other guys, he lived in the saddle. Every year of his apostolate was marked by the organization of a new congregation or the building of a new church. Bishop Carroll induced the Holy See to appoint him Bishop of New Orleans, but Father Nerex refused. The Catholic education of children was his most cherished work, and to secure its permanency, he founded the congregation of the Sisters of Loreto in 1812. He crossed the ocean twice to secure help and laborers for the missions. He thus became instrumental in bringing from Belgium the first Jesuits who settled in the West after becoming the United States, notably Father Desmet and a guy who became Bishop uh, Vanderveld. He died at St. Genevieve, Missouri on the 12th of August, 1824. Father Badin uh, still conducted his ministry likewise, mostly on horseback. By this point, he made it as far as Detroit and other early, early settlements in what became Michigan. It would go back up there and then back again to Kentucky on horseback. Imagine that, you know, it's going from Bardsville, Kentucky, to Detroit, Michigan, and back. In 1830, Father Badin offered his services to Bishop Edward Fenwick of the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, which oversaw missionary work with the Potawatomi Indians, particularly with Chief Pokagon and uh, the St. Joseph River Band uh, headquartered near Niles, Michigan. From that outpost, Father Badin visited Fort Dearborn, which is the future site of Chicago, Illinois, in October of 1830. In 1831, he built a log chapel on the shore of St. Mary's Lake in Indiana, on the site of what would later become the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. That chapel burned down in 1856, but he did not abandon the site entirely. Father Badin was named Vicar General of the Diocese of Bardstown, Kentucky in 1837. He continued missionary work uh, as well as defended Catholicism uh, in writing, particularly in a series uh, published uh, titled Letters to an Episcopal Friend. They were published in the Cincinnati Catholic Telegraph in 1836. In September of 1846, Father Badin accepted a position offered by Bishop Quarter of the New Diocese of Chicago and became pastor of the French settlement of Bourbonnet, uh, Bourbonnet Grove in what became Kankakee County, Illinois. Father Badin remained there for two years before taking one last missionary trip back down to the Kentucky Diocese in 1848 stayed there for two years. Father Badin gave 524 acres of land near South Bend, Indiana to the Diocese of Vincennes, Indiana, uh, which had been created in 1834. And later the seat was moved from Vincennes to Indianapolis. So that is a, uh, this later became the site, that donation of 524 acres, later became the site of the University of Notre Dame. Badin also organized the first orphanage in the state of Indiana in 1834 under the direction of two religious women from Kentucky, Sister Lucina and Sister Magdalene. In 1850, Father Badin returned to Cincinnati. Although his friend, Bishop Fenwick, had died in 1832, his successor in Cincinnati, Bishop John Purcell, offered the aging missionary a place at the bishop's residence. 
Father Bedin also served at St. Mary's Church nearby in Hamilton, Ohio. He died at the old Episcopal residence on Plum Street in 1853 and was buried in the cathedral crypt. In 1906, his body was disinterred and his remains transferred to the University of Notre Dame uh, and were reinterred in the recently completed replica log cabin on the site of the chapel Badin had erected there eight decades earlier. Badin wrote to Bishop Carroll on the 11th of April, 1796, in the following words. Probably there is not in all your diocese as large congregations as are those in Kentucky, and they are increasing day by day. There is not a Catholic here that does not bitterly lament at finding himself deprived of those means of salvation that were to be had in Maryland meaning those complaining that they could not have regular sacraments because of so few priests. In uh, 1793, on uh, September 18th, President George Washington laid the foundation stone for the U.S. Capitol building on Jenkins Hill. So uh, 1793 is rewinding back to the creation of the Diocese of Louisiana and the two Floridas. And in the same year, Washington was inaugurated into his second term as President of the United States. Time passed. Um, in 1797, John Adams was inaugurated into his first and only term as the second President of the United States. This was done at uh, Congress Hall in Philadelphia because the, the new capital wasn't finished yet. Uh, John Adams, we, uh, we met him briefly earlier in the Revolutionary period, uh, so now we cover, go into more depth. Uh, John Adams was born in Braintree, Massachusetts, graduated from Harvard, practiced law in Boston during the colonial period. His personal belief in law and order disposed him initially to be a loyalist, and he even defended the British soldiers placed on trial for the Boston Massacre. However, as the disputes over taxation escalated and the parliament and the refusal of the British Parliament to compromise turned Adams against Great Britain. He became a prominent founding father of the revolution, serving in both the first and the second Continental Congresses and becoming a vocal supporter of the new federal constitution to replace the Articles of Confederation. So he was a, a Federalist. In 1789, Adams became the nation's first vice president. He was a northerner, Massachusetts, to balance the southerner. Washington was the first president. When Washington declined to pursue a third term, Adams followed him as second president. But he only served one term. In part, this was due to his own abrasive disposition. But it was also attributable to a scandal, a political scandal, called the XYZ Affair. The background of which, the Navy of the French Revolutionary government began seizing American vessels on the high seas. Now remember, France, the, the monarchy, the French monarchy was allied with us and helped us defeat the uh, Great Britain in the American Revolution. Well, that monarchy was overthrown. And then the revolutionary government took over. And, and every year it became increasingly more radical until it was, it was just a bunch of, of, of psychopaths. So, now, so the Navy, the French Navy, which had been our allies, now became our enemy. They started seizing American vessels for the usual reasons, you know, theft, greed, arrogance. Adams valued the French alliance because he remembered, he, I mean, he was in the revolution, so he remembered and he understood that we probably would not have won without the alliance with Spain and, uh, and France. Um, so he sent a delegation to France to, to negotiate with them, 
to negotiate freedom of the seas, that they would stop stealing, basically stealing American commerce. The new revolutionary government in France was served by corrupt ministers who demanded bribes and added humiliating conditions for agreeing to respect American commerce. Adams refused these conditions, so negotiations collapsed. Congress accused Adams of incompetence. To defend himself, Adams published the letters of those French ministers, but he replaced their names with the initials X, Y, and Z. But the, but the behavior, I mean, the demands for the bribes and the, the obvious corruption and extortion, uh, that was published, and, and so the, that, that, that stoked public outrage at the French behavior. And that led to the passage of the Alien and Sedition Acts, as well as the termination of the Franco-American alliance. The Alien and Sedition Acts, 1798, were four laws passed by the Federalist-dominated Fifth United States Congress signed into law by President John Adams in a climate of fear over the French Revolution and the international wars which it triggered. Uh, these are, the Alien and Sedition Acts, are the first anti-immigrant -immig legislation in U.S. history. Uh, so the, the, the four acts. So the, the, the Alien Friends Act allowed the president to imprison or deport aliens considered, quote, dangerous to the peace and safety of the United States. So he could do this unilaterally. The Alien Enemy Act allowed the president to imprison and deport non-citizens who were deemed dangerous or who were from a hostile nation above the age of 14 during times of war. The Sedition Act criminalized making false statements that were critical of the federal government. And the Naturalization Act extended the residency requirement to become a citizen from what it had been only five years. They ex it, it was extended up to 14 years. The Sedition Act and the Alien Friends Act were allowed to expire when Jefferson was elected president. Uh, they expired in 1800 and 1801, respectively. But the Alien Enemies Act remains in effect. It's still law, as Chapter 3, Sections 21 through 24 of Title 50 of the U.S. Code. It was, that, that act was the legal basis for the now infamous uh, internment of Japanese uh, during the Second World War, uh, even Japanese who were citizens. Pope Pius VI uh, was uh, kidnapped, arrested wrongfully by the armies of the French Revolution when they invaded Italy, and he died in captivity on the 29th of August, 1799. As the city of Rome was occupied territory, the cardinals who managed to escape being captured themselves had to assemble in conclave in Venice, Italy, where they elected uh, pope pius the seventh as the 251st pope he was a benedictine luigi barnaba chiamante but pope pius the seventh he accepted election on the 14th of march 1800 in his 23 year reign pope pius the seventh would create the first suffragan diocese, plural, in the United States, suffer eight years of unjust imprisonment himself by Napoleon Bonaparte, but would outlive 
Napoleon, and he would live to see Napoleon fall. And, and ironically, Napoleon's family saw refuge, saw protection with him, with the Pope. And he did. He gave him protection. I mean, despite being wrongfully in prison by Napoleon, he protected their family. Better person than me. On November 1st, 1800, President and Mrs. Uh, John and Abigail Adams moved into the President's House in Washington, D.C. Uh, we now think of it automatically as the White House, but it was not called the White House uh, until the Roosevelt administration. Uh, prior to that, it was just the President's House. On November 17th of the same year, the 6th Congress convened for its second session for the first time in Washington, D.C., in the partially completed Capitol building. Previously, the federal capital had been in other cities, uh, Annapolis, Maryland, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and New York, New York. In the same year, 1800, 18 years after uh, Thomas Wyatt's retail production steam engine went into operation. That technology, steam technology, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, steam would, would drive the pistons and those pistons would provide mechanical energy. And those could be hooked up by gears and shafts to do virtually anything. So in 1800, Eli Whitney, whom we've already met, uh, created the cotton gin. In 1800, he, he created a new application for, for the steam engine to uh, attach them to a series of templates to produce uniform, uniform sized pieces of metal, interchangeable parts. In other words, metal interchangeable parts. Now, if I were, if, you know, if I were teaching this class live, you know, I, I, I would ask, you know, the seminarians to raise your hands if you think this technology was used to make the world a better place. And uh, so, you know, but obviously I can't do that because the fourth year guys are scattered all over because of, anyway, uh, so I can't. But it was not used to, well, it depends on how you look at it. The, they were used to make weapons. This technology, uh, the interchangeable parts, was used to make weapons. Uh, mass was first to mass produce the, the, uh, the musket. Uh, it, it looks like a rifle. I mean, it's a, long, it's a long gun. Musket was a long gun, but technically it was not a rifle. The rifle refers to with, with, uh, a later development in technology where the inside of the barrel uh, was, had grooves so that, so that the bullet would actually spin. So that's the, a rifled barrel. So the musket just had a long barrel, but it was smooth bore. And uh, it, it didn't use bullets the way we think of as bullets that are shaped, you know, with a point like a football. Uh, instead, the musket fired a, a, a ball, just an actual metal ball. Uh, but uh, so this that 1800 interchangeable parts technology, an essential contribution to the Industrial Revolution. Time passed, um, and Thomas Jefferson becomes president. Uh, the background of Jefferson has already uh, been covered. Uh, after passage of the Constitution, he was elected as the second vice president, serving under John Adams, even though uh, they despised each other. I mean, politically, they're completely out. Adams is a federalist. Jefferson, we've already covered what he believes, as well as temperamentally. They just, you know, they just didn't get along. And then in 1800, Jefferson was elected as president number three. Uh, and this catches us up to uh, getting back to Louisiana, because it's Jefferson who's going to bring, bring all that into the United States. In 1801, the founding bishop of New Orleans, Luis Penelvar y Cardenas, was transferred. He became Archbishop in Guatemala. And as we saw uh, alluded to previously, he appointed as administrator an Irish missionary priest, Father Thomas Hassett. When Hassett died, on the 23rd of April, 1804, another canon of the cathedral, another Irish missionary priest, Father Patrick Walsh, challenged the lay trustees of the cathedral in court to obtain use and direction of the cathedral. He lost because of the trustee problem that we covered in a separate unit earlier, because the documents reflected 
The documents of incorporation reflected the unique circumstances of St. Louis Parish, now St. Louis Cathedral, that it was founded by Capuchins of the strict observance who practiced corporate as well as individual poverty. And that remained unresolved at the time. Father Walsh died on the 22nd of August, 1806, with the issue remaining unresolved. And you may, so no bishop could be appointed because the Pope was in, was, in, uh, was in prison, unjustly incarcerated uh, by the armies of the French Revolution. The cathedral trustees in New Orleans supported a, a Spanish Capuchin priest. His uh, actual name is, he's, was Spanish, so his Spanish name was Antonio de Sedea, S-E-D-E-L-L-A. But he's better known in local history, New Orleans history, by, by the Gallicized form of his name, Père Antoine. Père, P-E-R-E, is just father, so like a priest, and Antoine instead of Antonio. So those who, either from New Orleans, who visit the cathedral, there's a, uh, there's a, a side, a street on the, one of the street, the street on one side of the cathedral, if you're facing the cathedral on the right side, uh, the down river side, is named for him, Père Antoine Alley. The trustees uh, on the uh, uh, Les le, le Morgueliers uh, in the local parlance insisted that they had the right to accept or reject any priest assigned to them to subject the uh, clergy to annual votes of confidence to continue for another year or be dismissed to control the remuneration of the clergy or not, to pay them or not, to regulate the sacraments of the church in the, in the physical church building, and to forbid the bishop access to the cathedral if he rejected their demands. So this, you know, we, we already covered the trustee situation, so this, here we see another one, and the first one we covered was in New York, and uh, we alluded to a few other ones, so here's the one in New Orleans, that's going to go on for, well, for half a century. And this catches us up to the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, as we uh, saw in last time with the Haitian Revolution, the a successful slave revolt and emancipation uh, uh, uprising that successfully created a new country, Napoleon lost an entire army corps attempting to reconquer Haiti from the slave revolutionaries. He failed. So this prompted Napoleon to uh, offer to sell the Louisiana Territory to the United States. So President Number Three, Thomas Jefferson, agreed. Now there was some constitutional issues. The uh, now we, we saw Jefferson originally. You know he was a small federal government type. I mean he was a, believed in a, a weak central government, strong state governments. Well, the Constitution does not specify a procedure for purchasing new land. So first, Jefferson tried to get Congress to amend the Constitution to create a way for him to do that. And they refused. Some just because they didn't want to do it, but others said that they at the Congress really didn't have the authority to do that, You know that, that a whole new amendment would have to be created. So instead, uh, Jefferson treated it like a treaty. Now, there is a mechanism for a treaty uh, in the Constitution. It has to be ratified by the Senate. So that's the procedure he took. The treaty was signed on May 2nd, 1803, but officially dated April 30th, 1803, reflecting the date of the agreement, the handshake agreement, by which the United States paid 60 million francs, or $15 million, to France, and in exchange received 828,000 square miles and, uh, from, from, the Gulf, from the Gulf of Mexico in the south up to the Great Lakes. The U.S. Senate approved the treaty on October 20th, 1803. The United States took formal possession of the territory on December 20th of the same year. The first territorial governor 
was William Claiborne, friend of Jefferson's, installed on October 1st, 1804 as the territorial governor. Louisiana would later enter the Union as the 18th state in, uh, on October 30th, 1812. So when Louisiana became part of the Union, what was the situation? Uh, so rewinding a bit to catch up with some other religious developments. In August of 1727, during the French colonial period, 11 Ursuline nuns arrived in Louisiana from France to open the first convent of religious women in the Mississippi Valley and in what would become the United States. They taught, nursed, and engaged in works of charity. They, uh, they endured, they stayed as the colony changed hands from France to Spain, from Spain back to France, then in 1803 from France to the United States. Since the Ursulines regarded the United States as a contrivance of Masons and Protestants, they were concerned that their property would be stolen, as the revolutionaries in France had stolen church property. The superior of the convent at the time, Sister Therese, wrote her concerns to both Bishop Carroll and to President Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson's reply has survived. Quote, I have received, Holy Sisters, the letter which you have written me, wherein you express anxiety for the property vested in your institution um, by the former government of Louisiana. The principles of the Constitution and government of the United States are a sure guarantee to you that it will be preserved to you, sacred and inviolate, and that your institution will be permitted to govern itself accordingly uh, to its own voluntary rules without interference from the civil authority. So they stayed. The Ursuline stayed. The Louisiana Purchase brought into Bishop Carroll's purview the, uh, the, the church in that former colony riddled with dissension. The president of the Board of Trustees of the Cathedral was a Jean-Baptiste Victor Castillon. He supported Père Antoine, who was an egotistical Capuchin, uh, supported him against uh, the, the administrators that Bishop Penelvar left, Father Hassett and then Father Walsh. But the lengthy Sede Vacante, vacant C, owing to Pope Pius VI being in prison, then dying in prison, then the delayed conclave, which had to take place in Venice, the election of Pius VII, who was also arrested by the armies of the French Revolution and unjustly detained, that lengthy Sede Vacante ended up being 14 years with no bishop. And that, so the schism deepened. Père Antoine's supporters formulated a plan during this period to write to, to Napoleon for uh, the purpose of having Père Antoine named as Bishop of New Orleans. Whereas another member of the board, of uh, the trustee, Jean uh, Castaneda, took the mission of traveling to France with $4,000 in bribe money for Napoleon to get Napoleon to pressure the Pope into doing this. Meanwhile, until the Holy See was free again and could appoint an actual bishop, Carroll, Bishop Carroll, became de facto administrator of the Diocese of Louisiana and the two Floridas. He was aware that the Spanish and French inhabitants of Louisiana resented being dumped into a Protestant republic, because the Spanish and French, of course, you know, of course, they were Catholic. And uh, further, he, as an Anglo, uh, you know, as a, a person of English, well, he was born in. Maryland, but you know what I mean, he was of English and Irish descent, uh, would be unlikely, that they would be unlikely to accept his personal intervention. But remember, Carroll had cultivated close ties with the civic and political establishment of the New Republic. So Carroll wrote for advice on this matter to, of all people, James Madison, the author of the Constitution and at that point serving as Secretary of State for President Jefferson. 
Carroll thought that appointing a French priest as bishop would be better accepted by the French population in Louisiana, who were numerically were the majority over the Spanish population. And Carroll, further, had access to numerous French refugee priests from the Revolution from which to choose. Specifically, the one he had in mind was a Sulpician priest, Father William Dubourg, D-U-B-O-U-R-G. So here is an excerpt of what Carroll wrote to James Madison in a letter dated November 17, 1806. I'll skip the, the introductory stuff i uh, pick up with. Quote, in the meantime, as the only clergyman in Louisiana in any degree qualified to act with vigor and intelligence in restoring order in the Catholic Church, is a French emigrant priest, far from any attachment to the present system of his country, may be appointed to act as my vicar without the disapprobation of our executive. I have many reasons for believing that this person rejoices sincerely in the secession of that country and the session of that country to the United States. All right, so Carol, so here it is why, explaining the otherwise anomaly, why would a bishop write to the Secretary of State about this? Well, Louisiana was just purchased, so it was part of the United States, but only as a territory, not as a state. So it was not, not regular yet. Uh, second, Carol was proposing to appoint a foreign national, a guy who was not a citizen of the United States yet, uh, to be bishop. And third, this is, remember, this is the background of the Alien and Sedition Acts. Now, Jefferson had allowed uh, two of those to lapse, but the other two at this point were still on the books. So this guy was a non-citizen, and he was from a, a belligerent country. France at that, because the revolutionary government was, you know, interdicting American uh, commerce. So that's why, so he was asking, if, if I, as Bishop Carroll, appoint this guy as my vicar general, to actually administer the new di the diocese until such time as Rome can appoint a bishop. Will that, because of his status as a foreign national, will that be a problem for the United States government? Madison wrote back in a letter dated November 20th, 1806, quote, the delicacy toward the public authority and the laudable object which led you, which led to the inquiry you were pleased to make are appreciated by the president in the manner which they so justly merit. But as the case is entirely ecclesiastical, it is deemed most congenial with the scrupulosity, uh, with the scrupulous policy of the Constitution in guarding against political interference with religious affairs to decline the explanation which you have thought might enable you to accommodate the better the execution of your trust to the public advantage. I have the pleasure, sir, to add that if the consideration had less influence, the president would find a notice to the same determination in this perfect confidence in the purity of your views and in the patriotism which will guide you in the selection of ecclesiastical individuals to such as combine with the professional merits, their professional merits, a due attachment to the independence, the Constitution, and the prosperity of the United States. So, once again, we see as Jefferson, consistent with Je what Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist congregation, what he wrote to the Ursulines, and now Madison as his Secretary of State saying the same thing. They, uh, you know, whatever their personal views regarding the church, and neither one of those guys were Catholic, uh, they did, they were respected, they were sincere in their, in their respect for that separation of church and state. So, in a, he, in other words, Neither the president nor the secretary of state had a problem with Carroll promoting a foreign national to this position of authority in the newly acquired territory. Time passed to 1807. Robert Fulton took the steam engine technology and came up with another use for it. He applied it to propulsion. He added it to a giant paddle wheel to move a ship through water. The first he launched was the USS Clermont. Uh, note, 
uh, those of you who are interested in these kind of things, little factoids. Uh, this, this, this had actually been done before in 1787 by a guy named John Fitch. But Fitch did not develop the connections uh, to mass produce it. So Fulton got the credit. The following year, 1808, uh, a lady who became St. Elizabeth Ann Seton opened a school, the background of which uh, St. Elizabeth Ann uh, she uh, was a contemporary of Bishop John Carroll. Uh, by comparison of her story with Carroll's story, we can see another side of the development of Anglo-Catholicism, meaning the English Catholicism within the English colonial context. They had, they had much in common. Both Carroll and, and well, Seton was her married name. Uh, she was actually born Elizabeth Ann Bailey, B-A-Y-L-E-Y. Uh, both Carol and Seton were, were born in the 13 colonies during the colonial period. They lived through the American Revolution, lived into the early national period. Both were from wealthy families, therefore had the best upbringing in terms of education and refinement. Elizabeth uh, was born uh, to the Bailey family in New York City on the 28th of August, 1774. Her father, Richard Bailey, was a physician. He became the first public health officer of New York City after independence. So I suppose today we'd call that the, the ME, the medical examiner, or the coroner. He was also a professor at King's College, which after independence was renamed Columbia University. Her mother, Catherine Charlton, was her maiden name, uh, and then Bailey was her married name, was the daughter of the rector of St. Andrew's Episcopal Church on Staten Island, New York. Elizabeth's mother died on the 8th of May, 1777, when Elizabeth was age three, leaving her and her sister Mary in the care of her father. Her father remarried the following year, on the 10th of June, 1778, into another socially and economically prosperous family. Uh, he married Charlotte Amelia Barclay, B-A-R-C-L-A-Y. She was the daughter of Andrew and Helena Roosevelt Barclay. Elizabeth and her sister endured thereafter the unpleasant status of stepchildren when her father's second marriage resulted in reproduction seven times. As often happens, the children of the first marriage endured neglect, ostracism, and at times overt abuse. This unhappy childhood shaped Elizabeth's personality. By necessity, she grew into a quiet, stoic, cautious young woman. Despite the mistreatment inflicted on her, external appearances had to be maintained because of, of, her, of, of the class of the family. So she was given a fine education according to the standards of upper-class females of the day. This included learning French, studying music, and a suitable marriage was arranged for her. He was William McGee Seton, son of a founder of the Bank of New York and a founding partner in what, what was, at the time of the marriage, the most successful shipping company in New York. And that's saying something. It was uh, the firm of Seton, Maitland and Company. The marriage took place on the 25th of January, 1794 presided over by the Reverend Dr. Samuel Provost, the reigning Episcopal Bishop of New York City. They eventually had five children, two boys, three girls. Elizabeth lived to see two of her daughters die. Having suffered so much in her life because of the loss of her mother, Elizabeth used her position 
uh, social position as well as economic position as a, as a, as a matron now, a mother, uh, to support charitable efforts to help orphans through Trinity Episcopal Church, of which she was an active member. All good things go away. Uh, her happiness was brief, as happiness tends to be. Uh, only misery endures. The family shipping business suffered a sharp decline owing to the French Revolution, which began in 1789 and turned psychotic in 1793. Soon France was at war with all the major powers in Europe, including England. England regarded itself as the natural sovereigns over the oceans of the world, so asserted the right to board and steal ships bound for enemy ports, even if those ships belonged to a neutral nation like the United States. This issue eventually led to another war between England and the United States, the War of 1812. But before that war, the firm of Seton Maitland lost several ships in this manner, which represented the loss of capital and cargo that could not easily be replaced with so much of Europe involved in the coalition wars against France. In addition to the mounting business losses, Elizabeth's husband began suffering from lung ailments that ended up being tuberculosis. Her husband's father died a year after her husband's health declined, meaning that her husband was not in any condition to run the family business, even if it was not hemorrhaging from English theft. They were forced to declare bankruptcy in December of 1800. This resulted in immediate social abandonment as the materialist ethos of the Protestant elite regarded financial failure as a sign of divine disfavor. Uh, so there's a book about that, um, the uh, Protestant uh, ethic and the, or something like capitalism and the Protestant work ethic. It's uh, by uh, Weber, Max Weber. Elizabeth, uh, after this social ostracism, which was a surprise, uh, got another surprise uh, when she found that a Catholic family continued to treat her in the same way that they always had, even though initially it was through correspondence. This was the Felici family uh, of Livorno, Italy, who had been on the receiving end of the Seton shipping business and did not dismiss the existence of the Seton simply because their business failed. They offered Elizabeth and her family a refuge in Italy, which promised a change of climate that could benefit William. They really didn't know what to do with, for tuberculosis. I mean, they, you know, they, you know, so they thought, okay, you have trouble breathing, maybe a place with different air would help. Uh, as well as a change of society uh, that would save her children from the painful shunning by their former friends of, of the American aristocracy. But going to Italy represented a tremendous risk. The ship could go down in a storm. It could be confiscated by the British and the family end up in prison, or it could be taken by pirates, resulting in the men being killed and the women sold into slavery. Deciding to take the risk, Elizabeth and the family left the United States and landed in Italy on the 2nd of October, 1803. Having dodged the hazards of the sea, the Setons were thrown in prison anyway. They were quarantined in what had been a dungeon uh, used as a, but it was being used as a quarantine at the port, uh, and it kept in the dungeon until December of 1803. The Felicis proved true to their word, placing a house in Pisa at the disposal of the Setons after their release. The ordeal of travel and the imprisonment in an underground damp dungeon was too much for William's lungs, and he died on December 27, 1803, only eight days after his release. The Felicis were completely open to Elizabeth and her family remaining with them, and she seriously considered the offer of permanently living in Italy. But the Napoleonic Wars had transformed Europe into something that was not recognizable. The, 
the French Revolution, Napoleonic Wars, Coalition Wars, that 26-year period, proved to be one of those events, like World War II, after which nothing would, would ever be the same. Uh, you know, and, and so Europe was, was not stable at that point. Um, nevertheless, uh, in the year, uh, she remained in Italy for a year. Uh, in that time, she learned of the Catholic faith from the Felicis and was deeply moved by their hospitality and help at a point when she was most desperate. And, I mean, think a woman with five young kids and a dead husband in a foreign country. I mean, you know, and... It, 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 she, she was in a position where an unscrupulous person could easily take advantage, but they didn't. And they asked nothing in return. Not only was this a stark contrast to the treatment she received from her former friends in the United States, but it was all the more striking because of her circumstances, uh, being alone in a foreign country. As a result of these experiences, Elizabeth converted to Catholicism. She was received into the church on the 14th of March, 1805. She returned to the United States and settled in Maryland, the only place at that period that had a substantial, well, that's, I mean, it was numerically small, but still it had the largest Catholic community of, of the states she could have chosen. There she met Bishop John Carroll, who encouraged and supported her efforts to open a school for girls in 1808. That's, she had to make a living you know, because um, her husband's business was gone and they were penniless. Uh, you know, she didn't have any any property to sell, uh, but she did have her education. So, you know, she could, she could be a teacher. Uh, at his suggestion, the school was first on Packer Street in Baltimore, not far from St. Mary's Seminary, which she had established. At this point in her life, back when she, in the Maryland period, Elizabeth began feeling a call to enter a religious life a religious order. Yet she could not abandon her children, which meant that a cloistered religious order was not an option. And uh, the solution he presented to her was that of an active religious congregation similar to the Vincentians of the Ursulines that would not be cloistered but instead would devote themselves to works of charity. And, you know, because of her excellent, excellent education, Carol suggested that she establish a congregation for teachers, like she could teach other girls to teach. She took the idea, and she took vows before him on the 25th of March, 1809. The year earlier, the year before in 1808, an independent seminary had been established in Emmitsburg, Maryland, by another French refugee priest, Father Jean Dubois, D-U-B-O-I-S. It was called Mount St. Mary's, to distinguish it from St. Mary's in Baltimore. And it also was still in operation. Father Dubois had land available, and in the St. Joseph Valley of the Catoquan Mountains, Mother Seton now, established the Sisters of Charity of St. Joseph, the first congregation for, f female, for uh, women religious created in the United States. Though its rule was based on that St. Vincent de Paul had crafted for the Daughters of Charity in France, uh, Mother Seton received a dispensation from poverty, from the vow of poverty for herself because of the need to care for her children. In the summer of 1809, Mother Seton relocated to Emmitsburg, Maryland, where the mother house was permanently established and where the school continued. By the time she died in 1821, her community had additional schools in Philadelphia and New York, as well as Maryland. After her conversion, she kept in touch with the Felici family, whose kindness after her husband's death served as the impetus for her becoming Catholic. On the 9th of February, 1809, she wrote to Philippe Felici, a letter which has survived, and illuminates some of the background practicalities of what she had to do. Uh, you, you know, just 
things don't just happen because we want to. So just the idea, oh, you start a religious congregation, start a school, you know, that, but then you have to make it happen. So in part, this is what she wrote, quote, my dear Felici, some time ago, I mentioned to you the conversation, uh, the conversion of a man of family and a man of fortune in Philadelphia. This conversion is as solid as it was extraordinary. And as the person is soon to receive the tonsure in our seminary, in making the disposition of his fortune, he has consulted our Reverend de Borg, the president of the college, on the plan of establishing an institution for the advancement of Catholic female children in the habits of religion and giving them an education suited to the purpose. The man to whom Mother Seton referred was Samuel Sutherland Cooper, whose considerable donations made the expansion of her early schools possible. The de Borg she referred to was Louis William de Borg, one of the refugee Sulpician priests whom we met. He's the one that Carroll wrote to James Madison about, and we will meet him again, as he did indeed become the second bishop of New Orleans. Mother Seton uh, spent the rest of her life in the service of Catholic education of girls until she, like her late husband, died of tuberculosis on the 4th of January, 1821. On the 14th of September, 1975, she was canonized a saint. It is often said that she was the first native-born citizen of the United States to become a canonized saint. Technically, this is not true since she was born in New York when it was still a British colony. But since she was living in the colony, when it became a state of the New Republic, it is still, it's still a fair title. Let's see. Um, uh, I'm going to stop there uh, because the next thing 1808 was the uh, uh, an upgrade, a numerical upgrade in the hierarchy of the country when uh, the Pope created four new dioceses. Uh, so we'll, I'll pause here and we'll pick up with that uh, next time. So for the moment, uh, thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned.